Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of What Did the Patient Say with Drs. Dana and Lauren Brindisi, sisters and owners of Carolina Functional Neurology Center. We are bringing you inside information from real conversations we have with patients on a daily basis. We get asked the same questions and want to spread the truth on health and healing because we believe everyone deserves to know the answers. Hi everyone, welcome back to another episode of What Did the Patient Say with myself, Dr. Dana Brindisi, and my sister and co-owner of Carolina Functional Neurology Center, Dr. Lauren Brindisi. Hey. Um, through these episodes, we're trying to bring you a lot of information and topics that we talk about on our with our patients on a daily basis, um, because not a lot of people have this information in their back pocket, and we think you all should know. Um, today, we're talking about eye movements and what that means for brain function. So as functional neurologists, we We look at eye movements a lot, and we do that because they're really good windows into our brain function. And Dr. Lauren's going to kind of walk you guys through kind of what that looks like. And it's interesting because even if you don't have a complaint with your eyes, it gives us a lot of information about your brain. So Dr. Lauren, take it away. Yeah. So I say this a lot to patients because they're like, so why are you looking at my eye movements? You know, how does that relate to my symptoms? I go, never do I have a patient come in and say, I feel like my eyes are jumping all over the place. They don't come coming in with some type of complaint specifically with their eyes, but it is really, really, I feel like I don't see that. I feel like they become aware of the jumps of their eyes. Tell me a lot of times, like, I feel like my eyes are going crossed or I feel like I can't focus. So like people notice like some of those types of things. Yeah. I feel like the verbiage is different, right? Like I have headaches. I feel, you know, some pain like behind my eyes or I have blurry vision. Um, I feel dizzy. Rarely is somebody saying my eyes are jumping. Maybe the crossed one I have heard. Um, But anyway, so we're looking at your eye movements. This is another important piece is we have your visual system that comes in through your optic nerve. Um, While we're analyzing that in some capacity, we're really looking at your eye movements. So you have your eyeball and then you have these muscles around your eye that are skeletal muscle, just like your bicep. This is exactly what I say to my patients. They're, they're, they're like rubber bands holding your eye in place. And then they have nerves that go straight back into your brain that control your eyes moving. So your eyes are the camera, your brain is the cameraman. So your eyes are only doing what your brain is telling it to do. And so that can give us a ton of information um, about the overall function of your brain. So in the office, when patients come in, we do a bedside exam that includes a whole bunch of neurological tests, but um, we look at your eye movements. And then we specifically in our offices have something called video oculography, which we have posted a few times, some of the videos that come out of that. Um, Their goggles that we put on- follow our Instagram, follow it. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Shameless plug right there. (laughs) Um, They have infrared cameras in them that allow us to measure and quantify the eye movements. So there's a cursor that goes in the middle of the pupil and then it actually graphs the information and records a video. The best part of video oculography that really takes it to the next level aside from doing a bedside exam, um, a couple things. They're great. It's great information um, that can really help in the education piece um, for patients to see. But the infrared part allows us to put a, the cap on the goggles and see what's going on with patients' eyes without fixation. So when you're totally in the dark, and that gives us a ton of information. I usually say, kind of speaking in generality, but we're really starting to understand your vestibular system's control of your eyes. Um, But there's other things we can look at, like um, autonomic function in terms of um, your pupillary light reflex. Sometimes we see patients are getting constriction and dilation of their pupils, but there's no change in light. Um, So even just that one test, just seeing what's going on in the dark already gives us a ton of information about, about brain function. Um, And then we look at a bunch of other tests. So we look what's happening when you're just holding your eyes steady on a target. What about when you're tracking back and forth? What about when you're jumping quickly? Um, And then we look at another piece called um, optokinetic nystagmus, which is just what's happening with your eyes. This is a reflex when you're sitting still, but the world is moving by you. We also have that reflex if the world is not moving, but we're moving. So uh, an example I always give is say you're in the car, you're looking out the window, there's lampposts lining the street. 
um, if we didn't have this reflex, everyone would feel super dizzy. <laughs> or trees. Um, a lot of people who have poor optokinetics, like they can't handle the light that comes through the trees. A lot of times I hear patients say that. Mm -hmm. Like even the cars going by or the lines on the road. Yeah, we could go into a whole thing about how complicated the, a car is for the brain, which we should. <laughs> that, that's a really interesting one. Um, so most patients come in ha having issues in the car. Um, it takes, there's a lot of processing that happens yeah. there. <laughs> um, so we analyze all of these. And what Dr. Dana is going to talk to us a little bit about is, okay, so we look at them, like, what are we looking at? What, what areas of the brain are, are we able to really assess looking at eye movements? Yeah. So we're going to try not to get into too much detail. Dr. Lauren and I could probably talk on this subject for hours and hours, but we want this information to be relevant to you guys. Um, but we want you to be informed and kind of understand what it, what it means. So um, when we look at these things, we're really looking and assessing brain function, right? So if we say there's an issue with your eyes, you know, oftentimes the, response or the question is like, well, I just saw my eye doctor and my eyes are fine. Cool. Yeah. Well, again, that's your optic nerve. We're looking at visual acuity in those scenarios, right? And if that's good, that's great. We need that to be intact also. However, there's this other component of the movement of your eyes um, and you can have one without the other. They're not, you know, can, they're not always an issue together, right? So, yeah. um, you might not need glasses, but you might need some eye movement therapy or vestibular rehab or something like that. So uh, when we, and then the other part of this is too, is people are like, well, do I need an MRI? I mean, maybe, maybe not. It depends on the patient, right? But typically when we talk about the dysfunction of the movement of the eyes, it's not really something that we're going to pick up on MRI when we look at the structure of the brain. So we have to find another way in to look at it and understand. And that's where this eye movement testing comes in um, and is super important for anybody that has neurological dysfunction. Um, so real quick, we'll just give like a nitty, nitty gritty rundown of some of these individual tests. So you had talked about, you know, when patients are looking at a target and the target's not moving, kind of what does that mean? in the brain. So a lot of times we're looking at, and depending on where that target is in space, right? It may vary a little bit in terms of where the stability comes from in the brain. Um, but a lot of times we're looking at brainstem mechanisms. And then depending on how that system fails also gives us some indication of where we might be looking at, right? So we may see patients that have something that call, that's called like a square wave jerk, right? Where we see failure of what are called omnipause neurons in the brainstem, or we may have see people who have nystagmus when they're trying to look at a target. And then we're looking more at like neural integrator failures and things like that, which are talking about a couple different areas of the brain. And then again, depending on where that target is, depends on what area of the brainstem we're looking at. So it's like just in one test, there's so much information and so many little things that we can break down to say, this is where that dysfunction is. And then to take it even further, um, we can say, is this happening on the right side of the brainstem or the left side of the brainstem? So that's a lot of information just to have a patient look at a dot and the dot not be moving. Yeah. It seems simple, <laughs> but our, it's, you know, it helps us to understand like the magnificence of what the brain is doing for us on a regular basis. I feel like Dr. Carrick when I say that, but it really is true because it's kind of crazy to think. I'm just looking at something that's not moving and all of these things that need to be coordinated and multiple areas could be dysfunctional that result in you not being able to do that. Simple, simple, simple task. And then that, that simple task not being done efficiently can result in you feeling really crummy. Really bad. <laughs> and you yeah. know, it's fascinating to me because when we go to have these evaluated in other situations, Sometimes they may be considered like quote unquote normal eye movements, but it depends on, um, usually nystagmus is not a normal eye movement unless you are putting somebody in front of an optokinetic, right? But you may have these square wave jerks and, and if nobody's looking for them, one, they're not going to pick them up and two, they might just think like, oh, okay. <laughs> Yeah, they just don't even know what to do with it. it. But, <laughs> yeah, it's super important. Um, okay, so not to get on too much of a tangent, but that's just when you're looking at a target with um, without it moving. And then we look at movement of a target, you know, smoothly across the screen. We're looking at parietal lobe function. It also looks at cerebellar function. If you're not able to coordinate that movement and it be smooth, you know, it's one thing to not be able to do the movement, but it's another thing for the movement not to be smooth or accurate. So we can break down a couple different parts of the brain there. Um, 
And then when we look at eye movements where you kind of jump from one target to the next, um, again, we kind of break down a couple different areas of the brain and um, importantly, your frontal lobe, but even more importantly, we look at, you know, different parts of that frontal lobe. So you can break your, the lobe of your brain down into its different parts as well. And then looking at your ability to, you know, stop accurately on that target, or do you overshoot the target or do you undershoot the target? And we look at some aspects of cerebellar function um, and even brainstem function when we say, okay, maybe they got to the target, but then once they got there, they couldn't hold their eyes steady, right? Whereas when the target wasn't moving and they were just holding their eyes there, they did okay with that. So then we're thinking like, okay, we've activated the brain in a different way because we've had a different eye movement and then that breaks the system down and then they're having trouble there when they weren't before. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, you were talked about the optokinetics and we look at you know reflexive mechanisms in the brain or we put people in the dark and we get to see these things come out that are maybe underlying issues that if somebody has a target to focus on, which we all do all day long, right? When our eyes are open, you'll miss it. And so it's really cool to be able to have that aspect of things to really look, I always tell everybody, we're gonna look under the microscope at your eye movements here when we run this test because some things we can pick up with the naked eye. Um, and if we can pick them up with the naked eye, they're probably pretty significant. Other things might be a little more subtle and this type of diagnostic test helps us to really break that down and see those things that we may not be able to with the naked eye. That was great. I hope that that was helpful for you guys um, in some capacity. Um, little nerd out session Moral on the eye The story movement. is your eye movements are really important for assessing your brain function. <laughs> yeah, it can give us clearly a, a ton of information and that is just really barely skimming the surface of, of the types of things that we can look at um, when analyzing eye movements. So if you have any other questions about that or anything you wanna learn more about. Um, you guys really wanna know what happens when you look at a single target that doesn't move, we can do a whole <laughs> episode or more. <laughs> We're happy to oblige. <laughs> but yeah, like, subscribe, comment, let us know what you're interested in learning more about. Um, we, You guys are the ones driving in what we're talking about based on the things we hear in the office and the questions we get. Um, well, somebody online. asked about these eye movements. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope you enjoyed. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll see you guys soon. Okay.